Okay, so we are starting module number seven, and in this module we'll be covering um, some knowledge-based and language-based parts of cognition. So we'll start off by talking about uh, semantic memory, and then in the next lecture, concepts and categories and some of the applications of concepts and categories, and then we'll move into language, and then finally um, some things in neuropsychology of language and brain and language. So let's start off with an introduction to semantic memory. So first off, we have to get out what is semantic memory or what do we mean by uh, semantic memory, and that is a permanent memory store of our world knowledge. This is, of course, different from episodic memory. There is no representation of when or where we may have learned the information, so there is no context involved in semantic memory. It is completely independent of context, which is one of the things, which is one of the things that uh, differentiates semantic memory from episodic memory. So some examples of semantic memory include things like what is the capital of Colorado, how many legs does a horse have, what color is a canary. Uh, all of these are examples of uh, types of knowledge that we have. So some key questions in uh, our study of semantic memory is how is that information stored, what is the nature of that representation, how is that information learned, and how is that information retrieved. Most of this is captured by examining what we call models of semantic memory. And so uh, we're going to have to get some new terminology out. The first of these uh, is the idea of a concept. A concept is a mental representation. It's often considered the fundamental unit of thought, or as Doug Medine, as Doug Medine says, uh, an idea that includes all that is characteristically uh, associated with it. Proposition, then, is uh, a relationship between concepts. Something like a canary is yellow is a proposition, a canary is a bird is a proposition, or a bird has wings is another type of proposition. A bird is an animal. And we'll take a look at how semantic networks and semantic models handle this kind of um, information. So we're going to start off by talking about what's called the Collins and Quillen hierarchical model, and we'll take a look at an updated version of this model at the end of today's lecture. The key properties of the Collins and Quillen hierarchical model uh, is that it is a network, that it is an interrelated set of concepts or body of knowledge. There are nodes within the network, which is a point or location in the network representing a single concept. So in a network, in a network, this is referred to as a node, but when we're talking in general, we refer to it as a concept. So a node represents a concept within the network. A pathway, then, uh, are associations between concepts, basically propositions that are directional. So a canary is a bird. A bird has wings. So these are property pathways or association pathways. So we think of them as is a pathways. So an is a pathway is one that denotes a category membership, such as canary is a bird, whereas property pathways describe properties of concepts, i.e. something like a bird has feathers. So it looks something like this. We have a canary is a bird, a bird is an animal, canary is yellow, can sing, um, an ostrich is tall, has long thin legs, can't fly, but is a bird, is an animal, etc. Um, and so we'll talk about the we will talk about the super and subordinate uh, nature of these categories uh, as we move through. So the first thing we need to know about the Collins and Quillen model is it has a property known as spreading activation. And spreading activation is the mental activity of accessing and retrieving information from the network causes um, passive concepts, those that are not currently in working memory, and activates them or puts them in working memory or certainly makes them more uh, readily available. So when we activate something like the, the concept of canary, it takes uh, and activates canary, but it also then spreads to related nodes. So if activation of the doctor node would also spread to the nurse node and the physician node and the dentist node and that sort of thing because they're related. If you remember back at the beginning of the term, we talked about 
um, different types of priming. And semantic priming occurs, say, when I prime you with apple and you're faster at recognizing banana. That occurs because of semantic, uh, because of spreading activation. Some key features of the model include that it is hierarchical, that is, concepts are arranged in a hierarchy. This allows for cognitive economy, that is, it removes any redundancy in the system. Uh, it also takes time for activation to spread across inactive nodes. So um, when we talk about the hierarchical nature of the model, if you remember in that previous slide, uh, we talked about how a canary is an animal. Well, that means then that canary inherits all of the properties of animal. So we don't have to include that it breathes and has skin in the concept of bird because that's contained within animal. We don't have to contain has feathers in canary because that's contained within bird, as also as it has wings. Um, so this removes any redundancy, so it allows for cognitive economy. It also takes time uh, to spread across inactive nodes. So uh, it takes longer for activation to spread across inactive nodes than it does across active nodes. So activation spreads quickly across recently activated nodes. So if we look here at something like Robin activated, it spreads quickly to bird and nearby concepts like canary, redbreast, blue eggs. So then we can see uh, this is hierarchical. The animal breathes and has skin. Then a bird is part of the category of animals and Robin is part of the category of bird. So that is a quick introduction to the uh, Collins and Quillen uh, model. I want to present uh, a comparison uh, model which is called Smith's Feature Comparison Model uh, and then we'll talk about the differences and distinction between these two kinds of models. So the general structure of Smith's Feature Comparison Model is information about concepts are represented as lists, not as a network. These lists include both defining features and characteristic features. So the defining features are what define that co concept and then characteristic features are one that are usually associated with it. So has wings, has feathers is a defining feature of a bird. Characteristic features are it can fly, um, builds nests, etc. So the defining features are essential, whereas characteristic features are common but not essential to the meaning of a particular concept. So here we have uh, the defining features of a robin, its physical object, it's living, it's animated, it's feathered, and it's red-breasted. Uh, characteristic, fe characteristic features of a robin would be that it eats worms and roosts in trees. Not every robin does that, but that would be characteristic of most robins. Now, other sort of more ridiculous examples, so the defining characteristic of a Leo would be they were born between July 23rd and August 22nd. And then what we think of as characteristic features, of course, this is kind of a silly example, are these things that we associate with Leos. Of course, none of this is in any way meaningful because it's horoscopes, but it gives you an example of how we think of defining versus what might be a characteristic feature. So uh, features are stored starting with the most defining followed by the most characteristic. And so what this allows for is uh, rapid or slower um, verification of whether or not something belongs into, say, a category. So here we have the attribute or feature model list for Robin. It's physical object, it's living, it's animated, it's feathered, it's red-breasted. Um, for a bird, it's physical object, it's living, it's animated, it's feathered. Uh, and then here we have a hierarchical network model. So you can see um, there is a lot more efficiency in the hierarchical network model as compared to the attribute or feature list model. Um, so, in both of these instances, models are often tested using what we call a sentence verification task, something like, a robin is a bird, and then we see how quickly you can do that. So if it takes you longer or um, takes you more time or less time, we can make inferences about uh, what type of information you might be using or how much information you require. So the model begins with what we call a stage one or global feature comparison. So a fast yes response occurs when there's a large number of shared features. So robin is a bird, fast yes. Lots of shared features, feathers, wings, nests, 
flies, etc. A fast no response occurs when there are a few shared features. So is a raccoon a bird? No, right? Because there are very few shared features. So we can have a fast yes or a fast no in this stage one global feature comparison. So uh, intermediate comparisons will then move on to stage two, a comparison of defining features. Some shared, some not shared. So is a bat a bird? Well, it has wings and it can fly. So we have to then think about what are the defining features? Well, it doesn't have feathers. So no, it's not a bird. Also doesn't lay eggs. So we start here with something like this global feature comparison. We then have this feature overlap score, very low score, fast no, very high score, fast yes, some sort of intermediate score. We then um, get either a match or a mismatch. So a slow no, a bat is not a bird, or a slow yes, a chicken is a bird. So when the defining features match, we get that slow yes. When there's a feature mismatch in the defining features, we get a slow no response. So we have a fast yes and a fast no. Uh, when there, a fast yes occurs, a lot of shared features. A fast no occurs when there are no shared features or very few. Then when there's sort of an overlap, we move on to the comparison of defining features and get a slow yes or a slow no. Um, and the reason why chicken is a bird uh, oftentimes is a slow yes because it, it doesn't fly uh, and we tend to think of chicken as either food or as a farm animal more than we do of it as a bird. And we tend to think of robins, canaries, crows, that sort of thing as birds. So that leads us then to um, thinking about some direct comparisons of the models and some central themes. So uh, the first question is one of cognitive economy. A primary assumption of the hierarchical model is cognitive economy because we don't have to store non-redundant facts. Or we only store non-redundant facts. We don't have to store the same thing over and over again. Because the members of a category inherit the properties of the category itself, we call this the principle of inheritance. So because a bird is an animal, it inherits all of the properties of animal, right? And then because a robin is a bird, it inherits everything that's bird-like and everything that's animal-like, and so we don't have to store all of that over and over again. So it looks something like this. So one of the problem, problems with the feature comparison model is it doesn't uh, account for property statements as well. Uh, as the um, network models do. So something like a robin has wings. Um, well, the model assumes a feature list that corresponded with properties like things with wings. And so uh, it doesn't handle them as quickly because uh, it, the feature overlap scores don't match with the performance data that we see in the experiments. So one of the things we see um, in looking at uh, semantic networks is what we call a typicality effect. And typicality refers to the degree to which items are viewed as typical or central members of a category. So um, there's some interesting research in this area about category membership. Uh, classic work by Batting and Montague in 1969 looked at category membership norms. You know, when people think of furniture, what are the first things they think of? When they think of animals, what are the first things they think of? Uh, Turns out less frequent members have lower feature overlap than common members. So robin is a bird, for example, is a common member, whereas chicken is a bird is an uncommon member. But we also see um, some issues involving um, distance in the semantic network models. So typical members can be judged more rapidly than atypical members because they're more closely associated with uh, a concept. So for example, when we think of um, a mammal, uh, certainly a skunk is going to be more typical than the duck-billed platypus. Um, and so what we see, I don't know what's going on here, uh, is this idea that um, typical members are simply easier to identify. And trying to come up with a model that describes what that is, is what we get into in modern um, network models. So a direct prediction of future comparison relates to how similar concepts are, and we get then into this concept of semantic relatedness. And this is one of the um, reasons why the comparison models 
um, gained some favor because of this idea of semantic relatedness and typicality. Uh, and so Rips did this really interesting study where he looked at what's called a multidimensional scaling solution. Uh, and I like this because it's relatively, it's pretty clever. So if you look here, um, what he's done is uh, grouped things that are more typical, that are more like one another. And so we see the concept of bird is most closely associated with things like blue jay, cardinal, sparrow, robin, and they're closely associated with one another. Then pigeon, parrot, and parakeet are also closely associated with bird, but they're more associated with one another. So pigeon is closer to bird than it is to blue jay. Uh, then we get into the concept of animal, which of course bird is closely associated with, but chickens, duck, ducks, and geese are more closely associated with the idea of animal than they are with the concept of bird. And then hawks and eagles and owls are sort of out on their own in the bird of prey category. And so they're not as quote unquote bird-like as say a blue jay or a cardinal. So that gets us then to how this is all treated in a modern semantic network. And so what we now have is a little bit of redundant information, but we also add what's called semantic distance. So here we have bird is closely associated with animal. Um, then we have um, birds can fly, have wings and feathers. Of course, birds can breathe, but it's not something we just automatically think of when we think of a bird. Um, then we think of sparrow and robin as being closely associated, and then chicken is all the way down here. What's interesting is fly is associated with um, bird, but usually down here with chicken they will have doesn't fly or can't fly. And certainly with other things like penguin they would have can't fly associated with it. Because most birds can fly, we associate that property with birds but we do know birds can't fly, so we have to then store the idea that a bird can't fly down with um, their property category. So that's why we end up with some of this redundant information. So in the modern network, um, the idea is it takes longer to traverse a longer distance in the network, and so bird is less associated with chicken, say, and this would also be three-dimensional where chicken's closer, more closely associated with animal. Um, and there is some redundant information. And this is really how um, we represent the idea of how information is represented uh, in semantic networks. OK, well, that's a quick introduction to uh, semantic memory. Next up will be concepts and categories.